So I'm following a very highbrow presentation on one of the cherished cultural songs of my generation and hallelujah with the brilliance of MC Hammer. Um, so I'm from Silicon Valley Data Science and um, we are essentially working to help companies reach the uh, goal of having an intelligence about the world they operate in and being able to make informed decisions on how they drive their business with the kind of factual evidence that my esteemed thought leader MC Hammer just shared. Um, so we're helping companies deliver on the potential of data. We are a group of engineers, data scientists, architects, designers, and project managers who work for other companies to help them realize their potential. Uh, so how many folks are familiar with the term data science? Excellent. So um, how very equipped that this is the sexiest job of, of the current era and I am a data scientist and that is as close as anybody's gotten to calling me sexy. The <clears throat> However, the, the, the reason we are called Silicon Valley data science is because we take the methods and the approaches that these great companies that have risen here based on data, uh, we just heard a nice tour of them in the uh, portfolio presentation of several of them, uh, and help other companies understand how they do that and bring that to their business ambition. So we do that uh, in four basic ways. Um, we are not business strategists. We do not advise our clients on how they should exploit their particular market. Uh, however, once they've decided how to do that, in today's world, data is often and almost always at this point a critical element of that strategy. So we do what we call data strategy, which is given this ambition as a business. Uh, oftentimes, if it's a retailer, we want to develop deep personal relationships with our customers so that we can give them better offers uh, get incremental revenue and more of their wallet share uh, and develop a rich understanding of their needs to guide our strategy going forward. That's a common business strategy in retail these days and there are things that you need to invest in and build in terms of data capabilities to realize that vision. So when we help our customers with a data strategy, we're essentially laying out a series of investments in capability to deliver those kinds of business ambitions. So that's the what should we do with data? Once we've come to a decision or a, 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 about a roadmap or they've arrived at one independently, then we often advise them on how or we help them design the architecture, the technology, meeting the people and the processes that it enables to deliver on that data strategy. And ultimately, we help them build those things. We have a team of folks who hail from the likes of Walmart, Google, Facebook, and the rest, uh, who are data scientists, who are data engineers, and we build the systems and build the capabilities that ultimately deliver these services to their customers. So our strategy and our advisory is informed by the fact that we actually do this. And this is rather important in a world where emerging technology is changing the game for most of the customers we work with. There is a lot of snake oil in the market and it is very difficult to ascertain what is really possible unless you are well versed in doing it. So we do that with cross-functional teams. One of the realizations I had when I was leading Accenture's R&D into data analytics was that uh, at the scale they operate in, and I still own stock and wish them well, and, and this is not a criticism, uh, but for the kinds of projects they do, they need to industrialize roles. They need to be able to go, I need five of these people and three of these people and two of those people to make a team to do a project. Now, that works well in very large projects that are well understood, but when you're trying to do innovative work with data, it relies on a lot of interaction between a lot of disciplines. So we work on small skunk works teams to deliver very high value innovation projects for our customers. <clears throat> It's one thing to do this in a startup in Silicon Valley where you have no legacy technology. It's another thing to do this if you're one of the world's largest sportswear brands and you want to start understanding your customers at a more deep level. They have big legacy systems, things like SAP and Oracle and whatnot. Uh, in that world, there's a lot of work to be done to get the data that has uh, formerly served those very valuable enterprise systems and put them to other uses. So we're not just a bunch of Silicon Valley kids going up to big enterprises so and saying, hey, we have a secret and we can tell you, uh, because a lot of time that crashes and burns. We also understand how enterprises work and how to get innovative capabilities into them. 
We do that, uh, and this is sort of uh, something that applies much more broadly than just data projects, by understanding what we don't understand. In the Rumfeldian uh, classification system, these are your known unknowns. What parts of the capability do we not yet know how we can do? And we build some uh, data-driven, deep learning, uh, AI-flavored uh, asset that makes a prediction, helps you understand what the prop next product we should put in front of you on a recommender page is, uh, helps you understand how to optimize optimize your supply chain or what have you. And ultimately, when that works, uh, a prototype works, we build a pilot to test that into production. So one of the early examples of this was the ability to model customer churn for telcos. They want to predict who's going to quit them based on um, you know, their contract coming up for renewal and their level of satisfaction. And you can actually predict this fairly well. <clears throat> and one uh, cell phone company then decided, this is great, we'll send a letter to all of our customers as they're coming up on renewal and offer for them a special discount to renew with us. What actually happened was they just reminded all their customers their contract was finally coming up for renewal and they can quit. And so they actually drove the exact behavior they were seeking to prevent. So piloting interventions based on mathematical models to understand what it does to your customers and their experience and how they react to it is important before you roll it out into production for everyone. And so we bring customers through this journey of building capabilities and ultimately deploying them in hopes that they will achieve their market differentiation and business objectives. This erstwhile gentleman, many of you may recognize, is Mark Andreessen. Uh, and he observed that the technology companies in Silicon Valley are doing things in a fundamentally different way. And the rest of the economy can benefit from that. So we are trying to bring these methods, as I mentioned, to, uh, to these large companies. <coughs> How do these companies we've all come to know and love do that? Uh, this is also, I would argue, sort of a cheat sheet if you're evaluating some large company and how they're operating today and you want to think through how are they using data and do they have a sophisticated attitude or are they likely to be blockbuster and completely miss a competitive threat coming? Here are a few things you can look for. <clears throat> uh, Companies often come to me and ask me, you know, John, we want to become more data-driven in how we do it. And the first thing I tell them is that they have to, from the top down, insist upon data-driven advocacy. We have gotten as far as we've gotten in the last thousand, several thousand years as humans, basically going on instinct. And instinct is a very powerful and valuable thing. But if you try to make an argument to do something at Google and you do not have data to back up that argument, you essentially get tossed out of the room. If you want a company to use data to make decisions, you must demand that you get advocated to with data for those decisions. And so having leadership that demands that the organization uses data to inform their strategy and decisions is a critical element in getting a data-driven culture started. <clears throat> It is kind of cruel and unusual punishment uh, to do that if you don't teach your management uh, cadre how to use math to make decisions, how to uh, interpret what somebody is telling you uh, with math. And what I mean by that <clears throat> is uh, one of the first projects I did when I was leading, uh, when I was working in Accenture's R&D lab was around uh, predicting supply outages at wholesale oil distribution facilities. So you're a major oil company, you have lots of tanks full of gasoline, Suddenly, one day, everybody's at your doorstep buying your gasoline. This happens about three times a year, and they wanted to understand why. Were we mispricing our gas that day? Did a competitor's barge get stuck in the Mississippi so they didn't have any? What's driving this interest? <clears throat> so my uh, manager at the time came to me the af first afternoon of the project and asked me how it was going. And I said, terrific. I have a 99% accurate model. I was like, whoa, that's really amazing. You've only been working for one day and you're 99% accurate. And I said, yes, I just guess no every time. The thing happens one in 100 days, roughly. So if I just guess no every day, I'm right 99% of the time. He did not actually appreciate that snarky comment, uh, and I received some feedback about my attitude uh, that I apparently have transcended in my career. However, teaching managers how to, it, how to receive that information and interpret it is a critical thing a company can do uh, to get data helping to drive their decisions. <clears throat> One of the big differences between successful businesses today uh, and a generation ago is experimentation. Um, it used to be that uh, you, you started a business and then it was about scale and efficiency. 
you know, we, we bottle soft drinks. How do we make soft drinks more efficiently? How do we get them to market more efficiently? In other words, it was about building processes as efficiently as possible. <clears throat> and these were long innovation cycles. Today, markets move very quickly, and organizations that design around experimentation, design around digital product experimentation, are able to advance much more quickly than those that don't. However, this is a very difficult thing to introduce into a large enterprise. If you're, um, it's one thing to say, yes, we want to experiment, we want to you know, fail fast. All of these things sound great, and you're, they're written up all over the place in the press about Silicon Valley and how we succeed here. However, nobody actually wants to be the one that fails. So it's one thing for an organization to say, yes, we want to experiment. And you can guarantee me that this experiment's gonna be successful, right? Well, no, that's kind of not experimentation. So helping companies understand how to make experimentation cheap, effective, and actionable uh, is a big part of helping companies understand how data can help them. It's also important to have the right technology structure and, and infrastructure to do these things, and that's where shared languages, both uh, computer languages and an ability to discuss a business, a shared language of domain, are important. But you can succeed with or without these things, but when you have a well-integrated shared environment of data and a language across the organization to discuss it, you create the ability to have communication across silos and surface opportunity that if, you are, uh, if you're working in, in very siloed business units that do not share data and do not talk to each other is very, very difficult. So these are a few of the hallmark elements of companies that are successful in using data to drive change and innovation uh, in their businesses. <clears throat> The technology side of this is also important, as I said. And here are some of the building blocks that we help companies put in place to support that culture they're trying to achieve. Open source software allows us to experiment with the latest machine learning, uh, deep learning. How many people have heard of like deep learning or TensorFlow? These are all really interesting emerging technologies and they make new problems addressable. But to try them, one of the great things is we don't have to engage in a three-month licensing discussion with our legal department to get the right to use a trial license to go play with Google's TensorFlow. Literally anybody on my team, whether I like it or not, and whether Peter likes it or not, uh, can go spin up an instance on Google's cloud and start playing with TensorFlow. So there's no barrier to that kind of experimentation and it can happen very rapidly. DevOps is bringing together um, <clears throat> infrastructure and programming to make it very, very easy to deploy things. So on the one hand, DevOps is about um, the people who build things being in a position to support them in operation, uh, a, famous, a, a typical sticking point in many uh, large-scale enterprise system development efforts. And it's also about making that infra infrastructure programmable so you can manage it very efficiently. Netflix, a fairly uh, large business in terms of digital products, operates its entire data back in back end with a team met numbered in the teens. Less than 20 people run that entire system. That is incredible and that is DevOps combined with the cloud. So if open source means we don't have to have uh, conversations about software license, <coughs> licenses, cloud means that we don't have to order hardware and you know, we do not see people's, you know, it used to be in Silicon Valley, like the new startup and one day the, the truck rolls in with all the sun servers and the big racks and now, they've, now they're ready to start their business. Now we just spin it up and with a credit card and Amazon. <coughs> So all of those technologies make infrastructure regularly accessible and easy to experiment with. Platforms and APIs are ways of making data exchangeable and understandable uh, in an organization. So Amazon, for instance, has a very militant view of exposing data through APIs. Um, a, a Google, a very senior Google engineer uh, famously argued that the thing that Amazon got right is that <clears throat> that stance that thou shalt not build two systems that are connected point to point, but, but if you build some data, you will make it accessible to everybody else in the organization through an API, supports their ability to manage tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of retailers as a single pane of glass of inventory now. So it's 
by making it decoupled and loosely coupled, to use some technical terms, it's very easy to integrate those kinds of things, and it is part of the reason they're able to do that. Ultimately, companies are solving problems that are specific to their uh, domain and are key to their competitive differentiation, which is to say that if you could just go look up on Google how to do it, it's probably not going to differentiate you in the marketplace because everybody else can do that too. So when we're doing these kinds of differentiating capabilities, we use agile methods because we're trying to solve problems where we don't actually know how we're going to do it. This is tremendously fun and negotiating a contract with a new customer. Hi, we're going to try real hard and we'll tell you how it's going. And no, I can't promise to cure cancer in three weeks, but we'll do our best. <clears throat> We'll tell you repeatedly how it's going, we'll seek your input, uh, and a lot of the things that make Agile so successful in software engineering are critical to data science as well. Ultimately, we're using fancy math, i.e. data science, AI, uh, call it what you will, to solve these problems. <coughs> So you put all these together and you can create an enterprise that is able to use data to understand its interactions with its customers, constantly experiment with how it interacts with those customers, whether it's the ad treatments they see, whether it's the products we recommend to them, whether it's the way we configure an interface for them. And that rapid experimentation allows companies to stay ahead in their market and succeed. <clears throat> What's standing in the way is often enterprise IT, who when they say data strategy is, how will we clean the data and make sure nobody bad gets at it? So what we're trying to do is change the posture in large organizations to think not what can you do to data, but what can you do with data? And we're helping them attract new customers. We're helping them target VIP customers and create deep relationships and loyalty programs. We're helping them automate systems <clears throat> so that they can do these things more efficiently. These are what, the, the, what we call a modern data strategy, uh, and it's resonating quite, uh, quite fantastically in the marketplace. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting that 50, something like 50% of data warehousing projects are judged a failure. Um, and yet, companies spend hundreds of millions of dollars on these things. When we target real business outcomes and innovate driving towards realizing them, we can change that and companies can get a lot more success and a lot more satisfaction out of the investments they make. So ultimately, we're helping them go from the lab, from experimentation, to building a factory to take the results of that experimentation and deliver it as new products and services that create new revenue and drive the opportunities they're trying to succeed in the market. In my last minute, we're going to detail every last step in this process. And when you guys go home, you're all going to be able to train your first neural network and go build an AI company. Just kidding. It's complicated. It requires a lot of interaction. It requires a lot of orchestration. And increasingly, it's regulated and you have to be able to explain what you do. These are challenges that companies have not faced before that are very, very challenging. And we are helping them do it uh, to drive innovation in the market and hopefully better products and services for you all. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope that uh, I'd love to hear what your interests are in data science. Come up and talk to me after the talks and uh, enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you.